can you appreciate this diagram can you see these nest can you see these nest of clear cells polygonal clear cells with abundant clear cytoplasm and they are separated by certain fibrous septa is separating them which is containing numerous lymphocytes is this point very clear this is your fibrous septa this is your fibrous septa which is containing numerous amounts of lymphocytes and this is your classical disgerminoma or the tumor cells okay. this is the characteristic what i was telling you this is the characteristic schiller dual body characteristic schiller dual body so what are the components of this you can see at the center over here there is a fibrovascular core there is a central blood vessel so what you appreciate over here if you can appreciate there is a central blood vessel there is a central blood vessel that is surrounded by a layer of a layer of tumor cell so one layer of tumor cell is surrounding the central blood vessel and this entire thing it is suspended in a cystic space so can you appreciate this cystic space which itself is also surrounded by one tumor cell this cystic space by itself is also surrounded by tumor cells if you can appreciate okay so this is the classical schiller dual body a central blood vessel surrounded by tumor cells within a space which is itself surrounded by a tumor cell this so today what we are going to understand now that we are going to read about the very important tumor that is your germ cell tumor of the ovary very very important very very important for you all mm, around 90% of all the questions okay from the ovary in your exams they are coming from germ cell tumors of the ovary so can we start germ cell tumors of the ovary yes everyone can we begin okay so what yes, are the sir. what are the germ cell tumors so we have already seen we have already seen the classification but i have written it once again because this is a long answer question they will ask you to discuss and describe the germ cell tumors of the ovary so first of all you need to understand what is the classification of the germ cell tumors of the ovary so we have disgerminoma yolk sac tumor embryonal carcinoma corio carcinoma then very important teratoma now teratoma can be div uh, divided into three main types mature benign cystic teratoma mature solid teratoma malignant tumor arising in a mature teratoma then we have immature teratoma and then we have monodermal teratoma teratoma can be of three types teratoma can be mature as well as it can be immature and monodermal in nature monodermal teratoma are those those teratomas usually remember teratomas these are tumors which are comprising you know tissues from all the three layers ecto endo and mesoderm now over here uh, basically normally the teratomas are like this but monodermal teratoma is when uh, only a single component is present in huge amount for example there is a stroma ovary is a condition wherein you uh, uh, the ovaries the ovarian tumor the teratoma contains excessive amount of thyroid tissue only so we are calling it as stroma ovary or sometimes they will contain carcinoid tissue so we will call it as carcinoid tumor so more will be clear when we will discuss about the monodermal teratoma and lastly we have the mixed germ cell tumor this is more common mixed germ cell tumor means in the same tumor you will have a corio carcinoma yolk sac tumor or teratoma you will have together that is a mixed germ cell tumor so this is the basic classification of your uh, uh, germ cell tumors of the ovary now remember one thing among them usually germ cell tumors of the ovary are not that much common but among them this one tumor that is your benign mature cystic teratoma mature cystic teratoma this is actually the most common tumor of the ovary comprising 32% of all the ovary neoplasm but remember in the exam if they are writing only teratoma remember only the benign mature cystic teratoma this is the only variety which is very common otherwise all the other kinds of teratoma whether it be monodermal or immature teratoma or malignancy in the case of a mature teratoma all these other things are very 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 rare so if you are asked if there is a question over here which asks you gives you two option to choose between which is the most common tumor whether it will be teratoma or whether it will be cystic cyst adenoma serous cyst adenoma then what will be your answer if you compare both of them 
if just the option is between teratoma and serous cyst adenoma yes which what will be your answer anyone if you remember in the previous lecture i told you that the teratoma is the benign cystic teratoma this is comprising 32% of all the neoplasm whereas the, the cyst adenoma serous cyst adenoma is comprising only 17% but if in your option you are just having teratoma it is not specifying whether it is benign cystic teratoma or which type then this is not going to be the most common because only the benign cystic teratoma is very common other types of teratoma they are very rare and because that is not mentioned therefore the answer over here will be cyst adenoma serous cyst adenoma will become the answer so uh, reading about the germ cell tumor if you see over here about the germ cell tumor very important that the germ cell tumor is constituting 15 to 20% of all ovarian tumors and most of them they are benign cystic teratomas which is also the most common variety or most common single variety of ovarian neoplasm however others principally seen in children and young adults so most of them remember they are uh, 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 you know they are benign in nature but others which are seen in children and young adult they can have a malignant behavior now these tumors are very similar to the germ cell tumors in the male testes and the tumors in this group they are derived basically from the germ cells they are derived from the germ cells as we have already discussed so remember some basic aspects about the germ cell tumors so the tumors which are arising from undifferentiated cells there are tumors arising from embryonic structures and there are tumors arising from the extra embryonic structures so tumors arising from the undifferentiated cells they include disgerminoma and embryonal carcinoma tumors arising from the embryonic structures include teratoma and tumors arising from extra embryonic structures include chorio carcinoma and yolk sac tumors okay now if you look at this basic diagram if you see over here okay this is the same thing i am telling you so germ cell tumors can either be giving rise to this germinoma and embryonal carcinoma now this embryonal carcinoma this embryon can give rise to extra embryonic structures can give rise to extra embryonic structures or they can give rise to embryonic structures so those giving rise to extra embryonic structures okay they will give rise to the yolk sac tumor and non gestational chorio carcinoma so chorio carcinoma which is occurring in the ovary is called as non gestational whereas those which is occurring basically in the uterus is called as gestational which is occurring as a part of pregnancy now uh, uh, this uh, from the embryonic structures okay teratoma both mature and immature can arise so you should remember which tumor is embryonic and which tumor is extra embryonic and which of them are coming from undifferentiated cells okay so which germ cell tumor is from undifferentiated cells which of them is from embryonic structures which are from extra embryonic structures very very important now the first very important uh, germ cell tumor we are going to discuss is your dis germinoma so what is this dis germinoma it is an ovarian counterpart of testicular seminoma so very very important thing you have to understand that in our uh, what should i say in our uh, um, male genital system in the tumors of the testes also we have germ cell tumors and uh, this dis germinoma is very similar to testicular seminoma so we call it as the ovarian counterpart of testicular seminoma which is an important exam question asked thousand times in the exam now as a single tumor the dis germinoma is is basically accounting for only 2% of the ovarian cancers but very important if you compare among all the um, you know of all the malignant ovarian germ cell tumors among all the malignant ovarian germ cell tumors this germinoma is accounting for 50% of all the malignant ovarian germ cell tumor now most commonly it occurs now most of the you you will see a very important characteristic of germ cell tumor most of the germ cell tumors they are arising between second and third decade and most of them uh, these tumors are unilateral in nature so most commonly they arise in the second or third decade and it is a tumor affecting children and young women as i told you Now, 20% of all the malignant ovarian tumors are detected during pregnancies. They are dis germinoma. So there is a high incidence of dis germinomas among the ovarian tumors diagnosed in pregnancy. Now, just like the seminoma, dis germinoma also express certain pluripotent stem cell marker. Again, a very important MCQ. So, what are the stem cell markers expressed by dis germinoma? So they are OCT3, OCT4, and NANOG. Now. they are also expressing certain receptor tyrosine kinase okay and one third of the dis germinoma tumors they also show 
mutations in this particular kit gene. A very important thing is most of this so around, if you compare all the germ cell tumors, most of them, they are having some endocrine function. They are synthesizing some of the other tumor marker or some hormone. But this is the only tumor, dysgerminoma, which is non-endocrine. It is not synthesizing any hormone by itself, except in certain situations, uh, dysgerminoma can secrete beta HCG, but it is very rare. And only in those cases where the tumor is harboring the placental syncytiotrophoblast. So syncytiotrophoblast, usually it is the source of beta HCG. And remember, beta HCG is the hormone, which is the hormone tested. Uh, beta HCG, if you remember, it is the hormone which is tested for pregnancy and it is produced by the placental tissue that is a syncytiotrophoblast. And this syncytiotrophoblast as a cell, they, are, they can also be present in the tumors. They can be present during pregnancy and they can be present in, in uh, tumors like the dysgerminoma also. So if the dysgerminoma is containing few syncytiotrophoblasts, then they might give positivity for beta HCG. But as such, they do not have any tumor marker. It is the most common malignant gonadal tumor in patients who are having abnormal gonads or who are suffering from gonadal dysgenesis. Okay. Now it is metastasizing this tumor, this germinoma metastasizes via lymphatics where into the para aortic lymph node by through which they reach the mediastinal lymph node, or they can also spread via the transperitoneal route going into the peritoneum. Now, this germinoma, very importantly, thing is that they are responsive to chemotherapy. Very, very important. They are chemo and radiosensitive. This is a very important MCP that is asked. One of the germ cell tumors, which is most chemosensitive or radiosensitive, the answer will be this germinoma. And the overall survival exceeds 80%. A very important uh, over here, the serum LDH level is raised and can serve as a tumor marker for this tumor. But remember, serum LDH is not something which is very specific for this germinoma. It is raised in any kind of gonadal neoplasm, even in testicular tumors or in any ovarian tumor, serum LDH can be raised. Okay. Now looking at the morphology, if you see grossly, grossly, if you look at these tumors, they are large solid tumors, more than 10 centimeters in diameter. They are fleshy, homogeneous, nodular large tumors containing areas of hemorrhage and necrosis. So microscopically, if you see, it is very much similar to the seminoma seen in the testis. So you will find lobules or nest of lots of tumor cells having abundant clear cytoplasm separated by fibrous septa that is containing numerous lymphocytes. Just to explain you this particular point, can you appreciate this diagram? Can you see these nests? Can you see these nest of clear cells, polygonal clear cells with abundant clear cytoplasm? And they are separated by certain fibrous septa is separating them, which is containing numerous lymphocytes. Is this point very clear? This is your fibrous septa. This is your fibrous septa, which is containing numerous amounts of lymphocytes. And this is your classical dysgerminoma or the tumor cells. Okay, tumor cells. Now, how are the individual tumor cells? Let us try and understand. If you look over here, the individual tumor cells, they are polygonal with a very distinct cell membrane and they have abundant granular to clear cytoplasm. Okay. So sometimes in case of dysgerminoma, you can see features of tuberculosis. You might see epithelioid cells. You might see multinuclear giant cells. You might also see certain naked granulomas. Okay. Like sarcoidosis. Now around 3% cases of dysgerminoma. They contain syncytiotrophoblastic giant cells, as I told you, they might contain and such kind of dysgerminoma containing the syncytiotrophoblast might secrete beta HCG. But as such, this beta HCG is not very specific. This beta HCG is not specific for dysgerminoma. Okay. Now the molecular alteration that is seen in dysgerminoma, they have chromosome 12 P abnormality isochromosome 12p and kit mutation. So these are the molecular abnormalities seen and very, very important. What are the immunohistochemical positive markers for dysgerminoma? So very important is your PLAP that is placental alkaline phosphatase. Okay. CD117 and D240. All these three markers that you see, they show cytoplasmic positivity. Then we have OCT4 nanoxal4. These show nuclear positivity. And in very few cases, which are containing a uh, syncytiotrophoblast, they might show the presence of HCG as well. So these are the positive markers of dysgerminoma. Is this point very clear to everyone? What are the molecular abnormalities? What are the immunohistochemical abnormalities? What are the microscopic examination, gross features, and the basic features of dysgerminoma? Yes, very, very clear to everyone.
okay so this is your another diagram over here can you appreciate can you appreciate this particular nest can you appreciate this other particular nest of tumor cells so can you see this individual cells they are polygonal or polyhedral they have a round nucleus as we can appreciate with a prominent nucleoli they have well defined uh, cytoplasmic borders as we can appreciate over here and in between these nest they are separated by fibrous septa containing numerous small lymphocytes so very very easy to understand this germinoma the second important uh, germ cell tumor over here is your yolk sac tumor now yolk sac tumor it is also called as endodermal sinus tumor also called as endodermal sinus tumor it is the malignant germ cell tumor which is showing differentiation towards yolk sac structure now although it is a very rare tumor but it is the second most common malignant germ cell tumor the first most common was this germinoma okay the first most common was this germinoma now it is derived from malignant germ cells that are differentiating along extra embryonic yolk sac lineage it is comprising only 1% of all the ovarian malignancies and the most important tumor marker the most important tumor marker of yolk sac tumor that is your alpha fetoprotein which is used to monitor the response to treatment and also it is used to detect the tumor recurrence okay now clinical features as i told you very importantly if you see all the germ cell tumors all the germ cell tumors are unilateral and they occur in young patients so this is also no exception they occur in children and in young women average of approximately 19 years most commonly they are presenting with abdominal pain or enlargement or abdominal mass they spread via the paraiotic lymph node they can spread to the liver as well as to the peritoneum and the prognosis is not that much good it is bad the prognosis of yolk sac tumor is bad so as i told you these are unilateral tumors large tumors around 16 cm in diameter the cut section is tan white or gray very important thing they contain areas of hemorrhage and necrosis now microscopically very very important there are two mcqs over here right away what is the most common histological pattern that we see it is also one important update i have given yesterday in youtube also if you see the two most common pattern in yolk sac tumor the first is your reticular or microcystic pattern okay it is nothing but it is a loose meshwork of microcystic spaces so you have multiple spaces like this which is separated by very thin septa that is loose meshwork of microcystic space lined by single layer of flat or cuboidal cells that is what is your classical reticular or microcystic pattern of yolk sac tumor the another important uh, uh, pattern over here is your endodermal sinus pattern now this pattern is characterized by the presence of a body i have shown you a diagram yesterday called as the shilla dual body now what are these these are glomeruloid structure these are structures which are resembling the glomerulus in which you can see the fibrovascular cores covered by columnar tumor cells which project into certain cystic space which again is covered by tumor cells i know half of you have not understood this but i will explain with the help of diagram so let me show you this particular pattern so this is the classical can you see the 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 cyst okay okay you can appreciate there are cystic dilatation and each of these cyst if you see they are surrounded by a single layer of flat cuboidal epithelium this is a characteristic microcystic or the reticular pattern of yolk sac tumor now this is one uh, image which is the endodermal sin sinus pattern what is this can you even can anyone tell me what is this this is your characteristic schiller dual this is a characteristic schiller dual body so let me show you with a high you know high power view this is the characteristic what i was telling you this is the characteristic schiller dual body characteristic schiller dual body so what are the components of this you can see at the center over here there is a fibrovascular core there is a central blood vessel so what you appreciate over here if you can appreciate there is a central blood vessel there is a central blood vessel that is surrounded by a layer of a layer of tumor cell so one layer of tumor cell is surrounding the central blood vessel and this entire thing it is suspended in a cystic space so can you appreciate this cystic space which itself is also surrounded by one tumor cell this cystic space by itself is also surrounded by tumor cells if you can appreciate okay 
So this is the classical Schiller dual body, a central blood vessel surrounded by tumor cells within a space which is itself surrounded by a tumor cell. This is the characteristic definition, and this is the characteristic image of Schiller dual body. This is a characteristic feature of yolk sac tumor. Now, very important thing is that this Schiller dual body that I showed you, this Schiller dual body as I showed you, it is the characteristic finding seen in around. Uh, uh, in this pattern, in the endodermal sinus pattern of yolk sac tumor, it is seen, and it is present in around two third cases of yolk sac tumor, and it is classically diagnostic in nature. The presence of Schiller dual body makes it diagnostic in nature. Now, also over here, if you see, there is also presence in. If you see in the histological image, you will see presence of certain pinkish or eosinophilic, pass positive diastase resistance hyaline globules. And these are not nothing but they are presenting alpha fetoprotein. They are most commonly seen in the above two patterns, that is the microcystic pattern, and in the endodermal sinus pattern. Now there are multiple other patterns that can be seen in the yolk sac tumor. If you see, there can be a solid pattern, polyvesicular, vitelline pattern is there, hepatoid pattern is there, glandular pattern is also there. So there can be multiple patterns that can be seen over here. If you carry out the immunohistochemistry, they will show positivity for alpha fetoprotein. Okay, glycan three, Sol four, and HNF one beta. So these are the tumor markers that we see for uh, yolk sac tumor. Is this point very clear to everyone? All these patterns. Yes. What is Schiller dual body? Is should be clear. As I told you, many of these cytoplasm they are containing cytoplasmic eosinophilic inclusions that we are seeing. So this eosinophilic hyaline droplets, as we can see, it can be present both inside the cell, but is both intracellular as well as it can be extracellular. And they are basically, you know, they uh, it is believed that they are basically, uh, you know, presenting alpha fetoprotein. So they are basically presenting alpha fetoprotein. Is this point very clear to everyone with regards to yolk sac tumor? Okay. Now, very importantly, the next very important carcinoma that is your embryonal cell variety of germ cell tumor. Now, coming to the embryonal variety of this germ cell tumor, if you see. they are classically seen in children and young adults so that is true about any germ cell tumor okay most commonly again they are presenting like any other germ cell tumor with pelvic abdominal pain and palpable abdominal mass now menstrual abnormalities are very common in post pubertal patients why because now remember this basically this is your embryonal variety and most patients they are uh, you know post pubertal if you see post puberty after uh, you know uh your menstruation starts or after puberty these patients are presenting with a positive pregnancy test why because they contain increased amount of beta hcg levels whereas those which are pre pubertal or pre menarcheal 50% of the pre menarcheal patients they show precocious pseudo puberty okay they are again never bilateral they are always unilateral and with chemotherapy the prognosis has been improved for embryonal carcinoma so these are large tumors <coughs> around 15 to 17 cm showing areas of hemorrhage necrosis now very important that these cells are growing like anaplastic malignant germ cells okay so these tumors are growing like anaplastic germ cells <coughs> in a sheet like pattern now individual tumor cells they are polygonal with abundant amphophilic or clear cytoplasm and they contain large vesicular nucleus coarse chromatin and presence of prominent nucleoli in some of them a very very important most of them most of these tumor also like dis germanoma dis germanoma also contain few cases of dis germanoma contain syncytia trophoblast but in embryonal tumors most of them they are containing the syncytia trophoblastic giant cells and this is the classical source of the beta hcg remember over here how it is different even choriocarcinoma is containing the syncytia trophoblast but choriocarcinoma also contains cytotrophoblast but the cytotrophoblast are not present in case of embryonal carcinomas okay if you look at the stroma the stroma is loosely edematous it rarely occurs in the pure form and it is most commonly it is seen as a component of mixed germ cell tumor as an as a component of yolk sac tumor uh, endo <coughs> as a component of yolk sac tumor or endodermal sinus tumor that is the th this tumor or it can be seen as a component of immature teratoma or embryonal carcinoma okay remember that all these yolk sac tumor and uh, this embryonal carcinoma they are not seen in the pure form they are maximally seen as a mixed germ cell tumor along with other components now very very important uh, point over here is that that very important markers that is the sox2 
and CD30. These two are very important specific markers for embryonal carcinoma. Very, very important. These two are very important specific markers for embryonal carcinoma. Now, if you look at this diagram, these are anaplastic cells. Look at the nucleus. Some of them, they are quite bizarre from each other. Some of them are large cells, some of them are small cells. So they are quite anaplastic, but they are present in simple sheets. Okay, very simple sheets they are present. Okay, so this is all about your embryonal carcinoma of the ovary. Okay. Okay. Let, let us look, and these are some of the other markers also, which are positive over here. One is the OCT4. SAL4, SOX2, these are positive, but among them, if you see, these two markers are very important. SOX2 and CD30, these two are very specific for embryonal carcinoma. Coming to the next very important uh, tumor, the germ cell tumor, in fact, the most important one, that is your teratoma. Okay. So this teratoma, if you see, this can be of two major types. Teratoma can either be mature teratoma, mature benign teratoma, which is the most common variety and also the most common tumor overall and the immature teratoma, which is the malignant tumor, which is the malignant teratoma. Now, benign cystic teratoma, as I told you, it is the most common ovarian neoplasm comprising 25% or more of all the ovarian tumors. Other types of teratoma are uncommon. So remember other types, immature type of teratoma, other any types, tumor ovary, monodermal teratoma, all the other types are very, very uncommon. Okay. So they are not very common. Okay. So remember this point very importantly. Most of the teratomas have a normal karyotype that is the 46XX karyotype and they are derived from post meiotic germ cells. Okay. So they are, there are numerous benign and malignant variants of teratoma of the ovary. So teratoma ovary can have, you know, both the component benign as well as malignant variants and teratoma in which only a single element is going to predominate. We call it as a monodermal teratoma. So listen to very carefully. This is also one of your gross specimens in your exam. Okay. First, we are going to start with mature benign teratoma. So what about the mature benign teratoma? If you see mature benign ter ter teratoma, it is also called as dermoid cyst. It is your exam question. This is, will be your exam uh, gross specimen also. Okay. So it contains various mature tissues derived from one or more of the germ cell layers. So it is going to contain tissues from the ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. It occurs in patients of all age group, but it is more common in women between 20 to 50 years or in the reproductive age group. It is bilateral in only 10 to 15% of the cases, and most of them are benign where the treatment is conservative. It may be associated with a paraneoplastic syndrome. Most commonly is inflammatory limbic encephalitis and only 1%, 1% of the mature benign teratoma, they might undergo malignant transformation. And when they do, they most commonly form squamous cell carcinoma, very, very important MCQ. Okay. So 1% of the tumors that undergo malignant transformation, the most common malignancy is squamous cell carcinoma. So grossly, they are always cystic. They will contain a cystic space. They can either be unilocular means they can have a single opening or they can be multi-cystic like this. They can have multiple locules associated with certain, you know, there is a, there is certain solid protuberance. Okay. There's a certain protuberance called as the dermal papillae, called as the dermal papillae. This is also, they also have one, a special name. Now it is not coming in my mind. This solid protuberance has a name also, I think called as the Rokitansky protuberance, they call it as, okay. But I will. Uh, see this, what is the special name for this protuberance and I will come back to you. Now, if you look at the cyst, if you cut the cyst, you will see the presence of hair. You will see dirty, pultaceous material, which is coming out. Oily fluid or serous liquid is coming out. You will also see presence of cartilage, bone and teeth in these teratomas. Okay. And very important. Usually they are cystic and they contain very little solid areas, but whatever dense solid area that is there, they are unusual in benign cystic teratoma. Okay. So if it is present, then the presence of solid areas is hinting towards any immature component, any immature component. So this is the classical gross feature as you can appreciate. Can you see this ball of hair? Can you see this ball of hair? And this is a cystic teratoma. Can you see this actually was a cyst that has been cut open. This was a cyst, which was cut open and contains the cystic space. Yes. And actually all the pultaceous material has been cleared. And then the photograph has been taken. 
Now, microscopically, if you see elements from all the three germ layers can be present. It can be ectodermal elements, endodermal elements, and mesodermal elements. So, among the ectodermal uh, uh, means among all these three elements, if you see the one element which is most common in teratoma is your ectodermal elements, comprising the skin, hair follicles, sebaceous glands, sweat glands, neural tissues. So, this is your ectodermal component that is very commonly present. Then we have endodermal components like the digestive tract mucosa, respiratory tract mucosa, thyroid tissue can be present, or sometimes mesodermal tissues like the adipose tissue, the fat tissue, smooth muscles, striated muscles, bone cartilage might be present. Among them, the most common component is the presence of ectodermal components. If any individual element is dominant, then we are using the term monodermal teratoma. Monodermal teratoma. Okay. Now, remember the secondary malignancy or the uh, malignant conversion that occurs it most commonly affects postmenopausal women. This is your classical benign cystic teratoma, as you can appreciate, which is the most common variant that we see. And over here, lots of ectodermal components I'm seeing. So we can see a lining of the skin. Yes or no? We can see a skin lining over here. This is a skin lining that we can see a stratified squamous epithelium along with that the skin appendages are there. Okay. What is this? What is this? This is your classical hair follicle that is present. And very, very importantly, very strikingly this clear areas. Yes. What are these glands? These are all these sebaceous gland. These are all the sebaceous gland. And I was talking about the pultaceous material that is nothing but the keratinous debris. This is your keratinous debris that is there. This is your keratin debris that is there. Okay. So this is your skin. That is the stratified squamous epithelium containing this keratin is there. Then you have the sebaceous glands as we have appreciated over here. And also the hair follicles that we have shown in this diagram. So these are the different components as we can appreciate and all of these are ectodermal components and these are the most commonly occurring elements in the benign cystic teratoma. Okay. What is this over here that we are looking at? This is a teratoma, benign cystic teratoma, which has undergone malignant transformation and this is your area of a squamous cell carcinoma as you can appreciate these squamous cells over here. Okay. These squamous cells. Okay. This is the secondary neoplasm and most commonly you have this squamous cell carcinoma. The second variety of teratoma over here is immature teratoma. Now what we have seen in the other variety of teratoma were all the mature components were present, but there is something called as immature teratoma, which is a very rare tumor. And it is different from the benign teratoma in that the component tissues, they resemble the embryonal and immature fetal tissue. Okay, remember, they are not like the adult tissues. All these tissues that we had seen over here, they were resembling adult tissues. But over here, whatever tissues we will see in immature teratoma, they will be immature tissue and I will show you what they are. They are very common in prepubertal adolescents and in young women around 18 years of age. These are solid unilateral tumors and they show mixture of both mature and immature elements. Now, unlike the benign cystic teratoma, remember, they have a very haphazard arrangement, haphazard distribution of the tumor is there compared with the benign cystic teratoma. And over here, the immature neuroectodermal elements are the easiest immature tissue to recognize and, and quantitate. So if we want to quantitate, if we want to say, if we want to quantitate the amount of the, the, the tissue, the immature element that is there, the easiest element to, to measure is the neuroectodermal element, which is also called as the immature neurothelium. Okay. Or you will see immature tubules, which are lined by columnar embryonal cells with stratified hyperchromatic nucleus. Or you might also see the presence of rosettes. Okay. And lastly, you can see immature mesenchymal tissue also over here. So can you appreciate? So this is your immature fetal like tissue, as you can appreciate. Can you see everyone? This is your primitive neuroepithelium. We call it as a primitive neuroepithelium. They, they, they are small. They are dark blue round in nature. Okay. So basically these are your primitive neuroepithelium. Okay. Now, this is again, this was the primitive neuroepithelium. Now, this is your primitive immature neural tissue that is the gland, the tubule. So, this is one immature tubule that is there lined by tall columnar immature cells. Okay. 
this is containing the tall columnar immature cells so if you see over here this is one immature tubule which is lined by your immature embryonal cells and this is all your haphazard arrangement of immature neural tissue that we can appreciate over here so this i was telling you this is your small round neuroblast which is surrounding a primitive neural tubule so this is a neural tubule and these are very small round neuroblast surrounding them so this is a immature neural tubule then you also have something called as a rosette so rosette over here is something which is surrounding what is called as a neuropil this is a pinkish neuropil that we can appreciate and surrounding that there is your layer of immature neural cells and this kind of rosette is called as homer right rosette called as homer homer right rosette is called as homer right rosette very very important homa right rosette is appreciable over here in this now this is your immature immature mesenchymal tissue that we can appreciate over here these are the immature mesenchymal tissue that we can see over here okay now very important thing this is basically for a post graduate but there is a basic grading and this grading is called as the norris grading so norris grading is a grading for immature teratoma and basically it is graded 0 to 3 depending on the amount of immature tissue so more amount of immature tissue more higher will be the grading and more badder will be the prognosis this is the only thing you have to remember that which grading system is there the norris grading system is there for immature teratoma and there are basically three grades including 0 and as the amount of immature neurothelium is going to increase the grading is going to increase and so is your a prognosis will is going to become bad okay so over here the grade zero is given for those tumors <laughs> neoplasms which are composed entirely of mature tissues and grade three is given for those tumors which are containing abundant amount of immature tissue okay i am not going into the details because this is mainly for post graduate but at least i have shown you this so that you can remember that this is a norris grading okay is this very clear to everyone nor is grading for immature teratoma okay now the immature teratomas as we know that they have a bad prognosis they rapidly and frequently they can penetrate the capsule very very important mcqs any any of the stage 1 ovarian carcinomas they have a good prognosis including the immature teratomas but higher grade tumors confined to the ovary they are treated with adjuvant chemotherapy so they respond well to chemotherapy okay now one very important uh, type of teratoma that we uh, uh, that is asked in the exams is your monodermal teratoma now over here one single element is in excess amount and there are two types of monodermal also called as specialized teratomas so first Five is minutes in the paper second is your carcinoid okay second is your carcinoid kindly mute everyone so first is your stroma ovary and second is your carcinoid now remember this monodermal teratomas are always unilateral okay always unilateral now stroma ovary is a type of teratoma wherein the entire ovarian tumor is composed of mature thyroid tissue and which might be functional might secrete the hormones t3 t4 and can cause hyperthyroidism is this very clear okay now uh, another type of your uh, specialized teratoma called as a monodermal teratoma is your carcinoid tumor so usually carcinoid tumors they are arising in the intestinal tissue okay that the same carcinoid can also arise from the bronchus called as the bronchial carcinoid but mainly they arise from the intestinal tissue the same carcinoid tumors they can be found in the teratomas and just like carcinoids at other places they can produce 5 hydroxy tryptamine which can cause carcinoid syndrome okay they can cause carcinoid syndrome a very important that the primary ovarian carcinoid must be distinguished from metastatic intestinal carcinoid because as we have seen that this monodermal or uh, uh, specialized teratomas they are classically unilateral whereas any metastatic carcinoid if you see they will affect the ovaries bilaterally and always remember in any history if there is given in the question and if there is uh, basically Uh, uh, there is a metastasis or you know if if they are speaking about bilateral ovarian tumor always first thing that there is a metastasis from somewhere okay very very important now also there can be something which is much more rarer compared to your monodermal tumor is the mixture of two 
of this tumor if both of them mix if the stroma ovary is present along with the carcinoid ovary then we call it as tumor carcinoid it is very very rare it is very very rare okay and the last and the last uh, important uh, uh, germ cell tumor is your corio carcinoma we will study this and then we are going to end for today's lecture now corio carcinoma remember corio carcinoma the pure primary ovarian corio carcinoma of germ cell origin is very rare that means ovarian corio carcinoma i am not talking about other i am talking about corio carcinoma can arise at two places one is your ovaries one is your uterus so that which is arising from the ovary is very very rare and most commonly corio carcinoma they occur as a component of germ cell tumor okay now they are basically affecting children and young women the serum beta hcg level is coming out to be positive over here and why they are coming out to be positive because corio carcinomas they are basically arising from your syncytio and cytotrophoblast so these are basically placental site or the, the, these are basically tumors arising from the cyto and, and syncytio trophoblast so beta hcg is one of the very important markers of corio carcinoma so the patient will come with a positive pregnancy test this beta hcg is also seen in many cases of embryonal carcinoma and in few cases of dysgerminoma and in case of pre, uh, pre menarcheal children they will present with precocious puberty just like other germ cell tumors they are also unilateral so could this part is very important corio carcinomas can either be gestational that is they can arise from the uterus they can be placid means they can be associated with the pregnancy arising from the the uterine placenta so it is called as the gestational placental corio carcinoma the other variety is your non gestational that is of germ cell origin that is arising from the ovary so fortunately this gestational variety is far more common as compared to the non gestational and why am i saying fortunately because this non gestational variety it is far more aggressive it is very less chemo sensitive sometimes they do not respond to therapy and they are widely metastasized and they can be fatal very soon okay now in the pre pubertal age in the pre pubertal age before puberty the non gestational variety is more common so the bad variety is seen in pre pubertal age whereas in the reproductive age group in young women both the gestational and non gestational corio carcinoma can occur with equal frequency okay if you look at very very important feature of corio carcinoma is that that they will show a lot of hemorrhage and necrosis okay in the microscopic examination also they will show a lot of hemorrhage and necrosis so this is the first important thing under the microscope you will see they are highly hemorrhagic highly nephrotic and very important they are comprising of both the cells the syncytio trophoblast as well as the cytotrophoblast both these cells are present over here unlike in case of embryonic tumors only the syncytio trophoblastic cells were present but over here both of them are present so we call it as your classical corio carcinoma they grow in a plexiform pattern now the individual side now now you have to recognize what the cytotrophoblastic cells are how the syncytio trophoblastic cells now syncytio trophoblastic cells if you see these are giant cells with multiple nucleus and they have a basophilic vacuolated cytoplasm whereas the cytotrophoblastic cells these are single cell well defined cell border abundant clear cytoplasm is there and they have a very prominent macronucleolus with vesicular nuclei i will show you okay so this is the very important diagram as you can appreciate over here so can you appreciate over here these cells that you see the cytotrophoblast if you see these cells are having pale cytoplasm they have a single vesicular nucleus pale cytoplasm prominent chromatin clumps can be seen so these are basically your single cell that you can appreciate over here these are basically your cytotrophoblast whereas the syncytio trophoblast they are acting as a giant cell can you appreciate this cell having 1 2 3 4 nucleus and the cytoplasm quality is highly basophilic all these all these are syncytio trophoblast all these are syncytio trophoblast the cytoplasm is basophilic whereas in case of cytotrophoblast the cytoplasm is pale it is pale and vacuolated is this very clear everyone corio carcinoma should have both the elements along with that a lot of necrosis and hemorrhage is there so corio carcinoma other thing is that remember pure form of any germ cell tumor that is the the corio carcinoma or yolk sac or your uh, uh, embryonal tumors pure form is very rare and they occur as a component of a mixed germ cell tumor and they are basically present in 10 to 20% of all the mixed germ cell tumors contain corio carcinoma the very important thing over here is the immunohistochemistry they will show strong positivity for beta hcg 
okay in the sensitotrophoblastic giant cells and very important the cytotrophoblastic cells they show positivity for p63 okay so is this point very very clear to everyone about all the germ cell tumors of the ovary so the next very important ovarian tumor that we will discuss is the sex cord stromal tumors uh, previously we have already discussed about uh, epithelial tumors of the ovary germ cell tumors we have already discussed in details now we are going to discuss in details about the sex cord stromal tumors of the ovary now the sex cord stromal tumors of the ovary is constituting approximately 5 to 12% of all the ovarian neoplasm and among the all the different tumors in this group the fibroma thicoma group is relatively more common now these tumors basically they are derived from ovarian stroma so these tumors are basically derived from the ovarian stroma and basically this ovarian stroma is derived from the sex cords of the embryonic gonad that is why the name is sex cord stromal tumor now this undifferentiated gonadal now this undifferentiated gonadal mesenchyme that you see in case of males this undifferentiated gonadal mesenchymal tissue or the stromal tissue is giving rise to these sertoli leydig cells okay whereas in case of females this undifferentiated gonadal mesenchyme is giving rise to the granulosa and the thicosa and the thica cells now this sertoli and the leydig cells in male the tumors arising from the sertoli and the leydig cells in males they are uh, actually giving rise to androgens now basically the sertoli leydig cells usually they are present in case of males but over here we are reading in context of ovarian tumor so inside the ovaries you might have these uh, these cells might be present and you might have sertoli leydig cell tumor which gives rise to androgens and in case of females the tumors arising from them they are masculinizing or defeminizing okay so tumors arising from the leydig cells and sertoli cells will release androgens and these causes masculinizing or defeminizing features now another very important thing is the granulosa and the thica cells which are usually present in females and these and these mainly they secrete estrogen they secrete estrogen mainly and the tumors arising from them they are usually feminizing so they might lead to precocious puberty so one very important thing is that the sex cord stromal tumors usually they are hormone producing tumors they produce androgens and estrogens so the related signs symptoms are there so if a patient is coming with a defeminizing or a precocious puberty then you must take into account the sex cord stromal tumors the first very important tumor over here is the granulosa cell tumor it is of two main types it is your adult and the juvenile type we will basically concentrate on the adult type which is constituting 95% of all the cases and they are involving the peri and the post menopausal women basically so they are constituting only 1 to 2% of the ovarian tumors and the granulosa cell tumor it is the most common malignant sex cord stromal tumor in the entire sex cord group okay now we will understand about the adult granulosa cell tumor so it is most common in post menopausal women as we have already discussed the average age being around 45 to 55 years of age and they typically secrete estrogens okay so the gran granulosa cells containing tumor uh, they secrete estrogen okay and if they secrete estrogen then they are also going to stimulate those organs which are dependent on estrogen like the breast and the uterus leading to endometrial hyperplasia and thus increasing the risk of endometrial carcinoma as well so the usual symptom being post menopausal bleeding in older women with menorrhagia metrorrhagia amenorrhea in those who are pre menopausal the endometrial biopsy is going to reveal hyperplasia in about 30% of these patients and adenocarcinoma is seen in another 5 to 10% of them so very important that the granulosa cell tumors increases the risk of endometrial hyperplasia as well as adenocarcinoma by virtue of secretion of estrogen now granulosa cell tumors if you see they grow very slowly and the metastasis over here is typically detected in more than 5 years after the initial treatment so it is a very slow growing indolent tumor wherein the chance of metastasis is you know after a very long period of time now uh, a very very important 
uh, tumor marker that has been widely used, especially for your uh, adult granulosa cell tumor is your inhibin. It has emerged as the most widely used tumor marker because this is elevated in all the patients with primary or recurrent granulosa cell tumor. But remember one thing, it is not very specific for granulosa cell tumor. And you can see elevated levels of inhibin in other types of ovarian tumor also. But once the diagnosis is made, okay, inhibin is used for monitoring the treatment and to detect recurrence. How? For example, if the levels of inhibin after surgery, after removal of the tumor, if the levels plateaus or decreases, that means the treatment is working. But if the levels start to increase, that means there is a recurrence or the tumor was not completely removed. So grossly, these tumors are unilateral. They are unilateral. They are solid cystic. The cut surface is tan yellow. Why they are tan yellow? Because they are producing the excess amount of estrogen. Okay. So tumors with a tan yellow, they classically produce excess amount of hormones, average size being 10 centimeters. Now, microscopically, the tumors are derived from the normal granulosa cells. So the tumor cells are also resembling like the normal granulosa cells, which are nothing but small round cuboidal cells with pale cytoplasm and ill-defined cell borders. Very, very important. I will show you with the help of this diagram. So can everyone appreciate the individual cells over here? Yes. Can you appreciate the individual cells? So they have a monotonous appearance. They are small, round monotonous, ill-defined cell border. So you cannot very much appreciate, just you can appreciate the nucleus, but the cell borders are not that much visible. This is the normal granulosa cell. This is how they are. Now they have a characteristic nuclear feature, which is a very important exam question. They have characteristic longitudinal, longitudinal folds or grooves is present. That is giving the classical coffee bean appearance. Now they can have several types of histological pattern. Okay. Like in the yolk sac tumor, they had the most common pattern as the reticular microcystic or the endodermal sinus pattern. Similarly, over here also, they have a very important histological feature that is they have micro follicular pattern. Now, what is a mi micro follicular pattern over here? You are going to see several nest and sheets of granulosa cells, which are separated or punctuated by small spaces, which are lined by granulosa cells. And these spaces, they contain eosinophilic secretions. This entire, this entire setup is called as Carl Exner bodies, which is the very important MCQ. It is seen in adult granulosa cell tumor. So let me show you this particular pattern over here. This is the particular pattern. Can you see that there are sheets of these granulosa cells? So this is the sheet of cells, okay, in the nest and sheets of cells and in between they are punctuated by certain spaces that is containing certain eosinophilic secretions. Yes, everyone can appreciate it. And, yes, and over here, they are also surrounded by a layer of granulosa cells as we can appreciate over here, they are surrounded by a layer of granulosa cell. So this particular cystic spaces, okay, containing the eosinophilic secretions and surrounded by a layer of granulosa cell, this is classically called as your Carl Exner body, which is seen in adult granulosa cell tumor. Okay. Very, very, very important MCQ. Okay. Now the next very important thing is this diagram. Why am I showing you this diagram? This is classically showing the, or highlighting the micro follicular pattern. So you can see there is a diffuse nest of cells. Everyone can appreciate and they are punctuated by small spaces that I told you. And this looks like as if they are containing several small follicle. So that is why this is called as the classical micro follicular pattern. And these individual spaces containing the secretion surrounded by the granulosa cells, they are called as what? They are called as Carl Exner body. Okay. So granulosa cell tumor, they elaborate excessive amount of estrogen that we have already seen, which is responsible for precocious puberty in premenarchal women or in premenarchal children, endometrial hyperplasia and endometrial carcinoma already discussed. Okay. And they behave like low grade malignancy. So they are potentially malignant. They have a very indolent, slow growing course. So you cannot neglect it. Even if it is slow growing, you cannot neglect it because after five, six years, a long asymptomatic period, suddenly the patient can present with metastasis. Okay. Now the most common driver mutation that is seen in case of granulosa cell tumor, very important MCQ is the Fox L2 gene mutation, which is seen in 97% of adult granulosa cell tumor. And this mutation is rare in the juvenile variant of 
granulosa cell tumor looking at the immunohistochemistry of these tumors the most important markers are inhibin and calretinin and these are though they are sensitive but they are not very specific for granulosa cell tumor other markers like s100 and cd99 is also present s100 uh, shows positivity in 50% cases whereas the cd99 shows positivity in 70% cases the new markers for the granulosa cell tumors they are sf1 and fox cell2 and these are potential mcq questions along with this inhibin okay this inhibin is also a very important potential exam question okay now we will go and understand this is again a, an immunohistochemical uh, you know must staining you can see a strong cytoplasmic positivity for inhibin for inhibin okay this is the ihc staining now the next important tumor uh, that is a sex cord stromal tumor is your sertoli leydig cell tumor now this tumor is constituting less than 1% of all the ovarian tumors and over here we are having basically two very important clinico pathological entities so we have well differentiated sertoli leydig cell tumors which is constituting 10% of all the tumors and we have sertoli leydig cell tumors of intermediate and poor differentiation which is making up 90% of the sex cord stromal tumors now it is occurring in young women average age being 24 years and around half the cases they contain mutations in dicer1 was an important mcq inict okay mutations and dicer1 is seen not only over here but there are multiple other conditions even in pediatric renal neoplasms i suppose it was cystic nephroma over there also you can see this particular mutation and this question was asked in the exam okay so very important the mutations and dicer1 is present over here in half of the cases now 50% of the sertoli leydig cell tumor they are also secreting the steroid hormone now which type of steroid hormone are they going to secrete yes androgens we have just discussed when we were discussing the basics so they will secrete androgens so 40% of the patients will come with signs symptoms of viralization that is defeminization okay now well differentiated sertoli leydig cell tumor they are benign tumor that do not recur after excision and generally they have a very favorable uh, prognosis whereas uh, if you compare it uh, you know Uh, uh with the intermediate and poorly differentiated variety they are generally favorable but also the intermediate and the poorly differentiated variety can also have good prognosis but not as much like the well differentiated variety the five year survival rate is approximately 92% so let me just show you this tumor uh, microscopically first we are going to understand the well differentiated sertoli leydig cell tumor over here so these tumor if you see they are solid and they are unilateral tumors with an average size of 5 cm okay and the cut surface is yellow or yellowish tan why because they are secreting hormone because of that they are filled with steroids and that is giving the uh, yellowish color now intermediate and poly uh, differentiated tumors will be larger with an average size of around 15 cm okay now very important microscopically we have to understand the basic features which i will show you with the help of diagram so well differentiated sertoli uh, uh, sertoli leydig cell tumor they will contain will show tubules of sertoli cells and in between you will see the leydig cells so this is the diagram as you can appreciate this is the this is the classical cut surface that we are seeing a classical tan yellow golden yellow appearance of the tumor they are solid tumors okay so this is the classical well differentiated sertoli cell tumors wherein you can see the classical tubules of the sertoli cells okay so you can see the sertoli cells well formed tubules formed by the sertoli cells and you can appreciate this is another group of sertoli cells what is this this is another group of sertoli cells sertoli cells okay and in between what cells are there in between if you see what are these cells that we appreciate what are these cells in between these are the leydig cells these are the leydig cells these are cells okay polygonal cells with abundant eosinophilic granular cytoplasm and round nucleus and round nucleus okay good okay so this is the classical well differentiated sertoli leydig cell tumor that we can appreciate now if you if you see the intermediate forms there whatever immature tubules that you see the tubules are not very much well developed so they are immature tubules and you will see large eosinophilic leydig cells whereas in the poorly differentiated varieties the leydig cells is completely absent and you will just see a sarcomatous pattern of disproportionately disposed epithelial cell cords that i will show you 
so this is your classical sertoli uh, this is your classical uh, sertoli cell tumor which i will come to you later later i think that diagram is not there okay no problem so this is basically just try to understand this is your well differentiated sertoli leddig cell tumor wherein you can see the sertoli cells well different well developed sertoli cell tubules and you can see the leddig cells okay in between now in case of intermediate and the poorly differentiated variety the differentiation towards sertoli cells and leddig cells are going to reduce so you will not see the well defined tubules as you see over here and even the leddig cells will become less as you go towards the poorly differentiated variety now very important is the immunohistochemistry over here so very important thing is the sertoli cells they show membranous staining for cd99 and nuclear staining for wt1 okay now very important thing is they also are positive for er pr they are positive in majority of these sertoli leddig cell tumors okay and immunostain for both inhibin as well as calretinin are positive so i told you that this inhibin and calretinin they are also positive in case of your uh, uh, granulosa cell tumor but they are not very specific that was the reason okay and uh, very important thing is that the, these neoplasm they usually present as a defeminization syndrome because of of release of androgen so there is a striking hirsutism or viralization okay now sometimes this is the sertoli leddig cell tumors where you can see mixture of sertoli cells and leddig cells so called as sertoli leddig cell tumors but sometimes you will see classically you know tumors which are just containing the sertoli cell you can just see the tubules you can see the tubules lined by the columnar cells over here having abundant clear cytoplasm so this is your tubular pattern of sertoli cell tumor which is another sex cord stromal tumor now one another sex cord stromal tumor is your leddig cell tumor so over here you will just have the leddig cells so leddig cells if you can see these are round polygonal cells which are containing abundant granular eosinophilic cytoplasm okay one very important feature of leddig cell and also an ex important exam mcq you will see that the cytoplasm is containing certain crystalloids okay and this eosinophil these are nothing but intra cytoplasmic eosinophilic rods okay with blunt and tapered end this is actually called as the crystalloids of rinki which is classically seen in leddig cell tumor so we read about the sertoli leddig cell tumor sertoli cell tumor leddig cell tumor and the associated mcqs as well so this is the characteristic rod that is the intra cytoplasmic rod that we see over here which is called as crystalloid of rinki seen in leddig cell tumors now the next very important group of tumor these are the benign uh, you know these these are the more common benign tumors of the sex cord that is the fibromas thicomas and fibrothicomas so let us understand these tumor now these tumors are arising from the ovarian stroma and they are composed either predominantly if they are composed of fibroblast then we will call it as fibroma if they contain spindle cells then we call it as thicoma okay and they account for 4% of all the ovarian tumors so if you see among all the sex cord stromal tumors the most common entity are the fibromas thicomas and the fibrothicomas tumors which are containing mixture of both the fibroblast as well as the spindle cells with lipid droplet they are called as fibrothicomas okay now usually they are not hormonally active as a rule pure fibromas they are hormonally inactive in nature so they are unilateral tumors and on histological examination you will see well differentiated fibroblast in case of your fibromas okay and remember they come uh, you know these come into attention because of the presence of pelvic mass and there are two syndromes associated with it which i will tell you later on so this is the large bisected fibroma you can already appreciate that there is such a lot of fibrosis that has taken place so there is a white firm mass they present as gross appearance okay so grossly they present as a white fibrous firm mass so under the microscope you can see the bland spindle shaped cells you can see bland spindle shaped abundant fibroblast is there which is separated by abundant eosinophilic collagen so the, the fibroblast is the one which is actually secreting the collagen over here so this is the classical appearance of a fibroma where you can see the spindle shaped fibroblast this is the thicoma na thicomas are the one which are the cells containing lipids actually so these are nests of pale vacuolated spindle cells so these are spindle cells which are vacuolated actually they are oval to spindle shaped okay you will see a lot of clearing okay this is the thicoma okay and this is the case wherein you have both this is the fibroma component fibrothicoma. spindle shaped cells and this is the 
Thikoma component. Now, what you have to do, you don't have to go into the details, I just the diagrams, much. because these diagrams are getting asked in the exam. And for example, the MCQs are the same, but what is very important that the pattern of asking the questions have become different. So instead of asking you directly, they will give you one syndrome and they will give you one diagram. And then you will be supposed to give the, now remember at the undergraduate level, it will never happen that you will have to diagnose from the given histological diagram. Always some correlating history will be there. Diagram is just to help you. If you can remember wisely, it makes things easy. So as we see over here, if you appreciate, there are two important syndromes, which are associated with the fibroma thicoma group. And these are favorite neat PG questions. Okay. This has been asked from time and again. Now there are two associations that you see with such kind of tumor. The first association is ascites. It is found in 40% cases in which the tumors measure more than six meter in diameter. Uncommonly, there is also what is called as hydrothorax on the right side. So this combination of a fibroma ovarian tumor along with a hydrothorax and ascites, this combination is called as Meigs syndrome. It's a very time and tested question. So you might be just given all the information will be given, all this gross finding will be given, one histological image will be given. Then they will say that the patient developed hydrothorax also, USG was done, there was ascites also. So what is the possible tumor? Uh, absolutely, it will be either fibroma or fibrothicoma. Okay. The second important association with this uh, tumor is the basal cell nevus syndrome. Now, the vast majority of the fibromas, if you see, and even the fibrothicomas and thicomas, they are benign in nature. Okay, so the rarely cellular fibromas and mitotic activity and increased NC ratio can be identified, but they may pursue a malignant course and it is very, very rare. Very, very, very rare. Chances 0.001%, they might change into a fibrosarcoma. So this is actually the most common group of tumor under the sex cord stomal tumor, but it is the most common benign. Okay, if you and also overall, but the most common malignant will become your granulosa cell tumor. Okay, so I think we have completed uh, this group. Now, there are other sex cord stomal tumors. For example, we have already read about this the pure cell, the pure ledic cell tumor, wherein you see the rinkis crystalloid, which I've already discussed in detail. I'm not discussing that again. Then, one very important thing is that what is a gonadoblastoma? It is actually an uncommon tumor wherein you have the germ cells along with the sex cord stromal derivatives. Okay, so this is actually called as a gonadoblastoma. So some MCQs come that all of the following is true regarding gonadoblastoma except. So this is are all the findings that you should remember. It occurs in individuals with abnormal sexual development and in gonads of indeterminate nature. 80% of the patients are phenotypic female. What do you mean by phenotypic female? Phenotypic means from outside, the person is looking like a girl only. Okay. But from inside, you cannot say looking at the genitals, whether it is girl or boy. Okay. So 80% of the patients present as females and around 20% they present as phenotypic males with undescended testis and female internal secondary organ. A coexistent dysgerminoma occurs in 50% of the cases. So what is very important if they ask you, which is the most common germ cell tumor that you will see in a case of a gonadoblastoma? So the answer will be dysgerminoma. Dis the prognosis is excellent if the tumor is completely excised. So this gonadoblastoma is very important question that is asked. Now the fourth group of tumor that we are going to understand, which is very short and very important also is the metastatic tumor of the ovary. So these are the most common tumors, which presents as bilateral ovarian tumor mass and the metastasis into the ovary can either be the means the tumors, which will metastasize to the ovary can either be of Mullerian origin, or they can be extra Mullerian origin. So the Mullerian origin tumors are more commonly metastatic to the ovary. And these include tumors of the endometrium or from the myometrium or from the uterus as a whole tumors of the fallopian tube tumors from the contralateral ovary or primary pelvic peritoneal tumors, which metastasizes to the ovaries and extra Mullerian origin. So which are the other tumors, which can metastasize to the ovary, the carcinoma of the breast, the carcinoma of the gastrointestinal tract, including the colon stomach, biliary tract, and the pancreas. Now, one very important thing is even, uh, you know, there are certain tumors 
which causes means certain ovarian tumors can cause pseudo myxoma peritonei wherein the mucinous material enters the peritoneal cavity but remember the most common cause of pseudo myxoma peritonei is not ovarian tumor it is in fact appendicial tumor so this is an important mcq which is asked and another very important time and tested mcq that is the classic metastatic gid uh, git cancer classically the metastatic git cancer especially the signet ring variety of carcinoma okay so over here they you know uh, they involve or they metastasize to the ovaries bilaterally okay and these tumors are called as the krukenberg tumor which cause you know which involves bilateral ovarian okay which causes metastasis in bilateral ovarian uh, you know ovaries and these cells have characteristic signet ring appearance so i think i have already taught about this in the gastric carcinoma and you understand what is the krukenberg tumor it is a bilateral ovarian metastasis from the gi primary especially the signet ring uh, carcinoma variety okay now the clinical features of uh, most of the ovarian carcinomas as a whole so most of them they produce similar clinical manifestation the most common being lower abdominal pain and abdominal enlargement benign tumors are easily resected and they are cured whereas the malignant ones present with progressive weakness weight loss and cachexia now malignant tumors are also the ones which will break the capsule enter the peritoneal cavity and can uh, present with massive ascites wherein the cytological study is going to show presence of exfoliated tumor cells or they are also going to metastasize to the liver links git and sometimes they can also metastasize across the midline to opposite ovary and approximately in 50% of the cases this might happens and once that happens it portends a very poor prognosis now most women with ovarian carcinoma present at a very high end stage wherein already bilateral metastasis is present remember ca 125 it is not used for diagnosis of the disease it is rather used in patients with a known disease just to monitor and to uh, just to monitor the disease recurrence and the progression and ca 125 the nature is it is a glycoprotein marker this has been taught in details in neoplasia also all the tumor markers and what is the nature so the the prevention can be done via screening for the braca mutation or we have to ask for the family history in case we want to rule out any familial uh, ovarian carcinoma with this we have you know we have uh, completed in details all the ovarian tumors and we have also completed the female genital tract any questions so far over here with regards to ovarian tumors everyone